Hello, hello. A very good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome to the Multimodality Imaging Conference. And today is a very special topic, guys. That's echo attack and echo emergencies. And I'm sure all our fellows have already nailed most of them and have attacked, you know, to their best. And I'm sure the first year fellows are even more special because I'm sure you've already encountered one so far. All right, guys, let's get started without any delay. All right, so the first situation is our poor cardiology fellow. It's the ER, dreaded ER call. That's our reaction after the 50th consult of the day, right? <laughs> All right, let's move on to our case one, guys. So we have a 42-year-old male with no prior medical history who comes in with dyspnea on exertion and fatigue for two weeks since he has recovered from a URI, hoping it's not COVID. Blood pressure is 80 over 60 with a heart rate of 110 beats per minute. Again, guys, I want to remind you, we're going to keep this as interactive, but remind, please remember there are people you know, watching online, so please be loud when you talk out, okay? And don't worry if it's incorrect, so because this is just emergency, so it's not cardiology yet. All right, so let's see if you can guess how what's the EKG showing. I hope you can see it. Just pick the most obvious one, guys. What's the most obvious? Oh, perfect. All right, so you see those complexes definitely alternating, right? And uh, you know what is it suggesting, guys? Possible pericardial pathology, of course, right? And then we are going to go to labs. Elevated white count, elevated ESR and CRP, otherwise normal. Again, all everything goes with the inflammation, which we talked about, right? Just a few days ago, he's still recovering. I'm sure, what's the next step, guys? Ah, right? It's a stat, actually, echocardiogram. All right, let's see if you can... Okay. And what's that blue arrow? Uh, Perfect, guys, right? So definitely you can see a sizable pericardial effusion, mostly circumferential distribution. And what's more important is that one indicated by the blue arrow, which is basically the RV diastolic collapse. When you talk about RV diastolic collapse, I know it's an easy terminology to use, but for first year fellows, especially here in the room, how do you really recognize that, right? We're gonna talk about that. And also remember guys, it's not just the diastolic collapse. Like, so if you're really having a tough time to see which phase of cardiac cycle it is, I would really suggest, you know, pausing the video and then slowly, you know, kind of, you know, going through it. So that way you can see when the tricuspid valve opens, you see that's the early diastole and you basically see that the RV is still compressed, right? So that's the early diastole where the RV is supposed to be expanding. And also remember, it's not just the diastolic collapse, it's the duration of the diastolic collapse, which is very important. Is it staying, is it a brief collapse versus is it staying collapsed through the cardiac cycle or through the diastole, especially more than one third of diastole, if it stays collapsed, that's, that's when it's more significant, right? So very important to note that, guys. And what are the supporting findings do you see here? You definitely see that RV respirophasic variation and the LV respirophasic variation and sometimes, remember guys, if, you, if the RV diastolic collapse is not obvious on the 2D images, always get your M mode to help out, right? So the M mode can definitely show that invert RV motion, especially in early diastole. If you see the red arrow, you can clearly see it's that, that sustained collapse through the diastole, right? So very important. So I think all of you guys in the room have you know, identified this. So, Again, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with the classic signs of tamponade, but again, what's the most sensitive one, guys? Sensitive. Perfect, right? So very sensitive sign. So, you know, I, 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 so remember, though, there are exceptions to these, which we'll talk about in a little bit. You know, there could be low pressure tamponade where the IVC doesn't necessarily have to be dilated and non-collapsing, but that's one of the earliest signs you should look for. And the more specific signs, which we just talked about, right? Both the RA and RV diastolic collapse, RV systolic inversion, especially more than one third of the cardiac cycle again. So the supporting signs, again, we just talked about that, the respirophasic variation of the 
left side and the right side being diagnostic. And again, uh, you know, again, one thing I want to tell you, the cutoff for ASC is 30% and 60% as opposed to 25 for board purposes. But you know, they usually give you pretty classic presentations for boards. And again, we just talked about the variability in certain cases, which we'll talk about soon too. And in like, you know, imagine case of severe pulmonary hypertension, you're not going to see these typical signs. And an echo-guided approach to pericardiocentesis is definitely the first line, right? So what's the most common, you know, what's the most common one, guys, when you see pericardial effusion? Uh, circumferential, right? So and most of the times you do an echocardiogram, look at the most, like you see the pocket, which is the largest in dimension, and go for that, right? So the paraapical region is mostly safe. And what's the biggest risk we carry with any pericardiocentesis is basically hitting the, you know, uh, ventricles or any any hitting anything within the cardiac structures. So that's one thing which is very important. So always remember echo-guided pericardiocentesis is definitive, you know, first line of therapy. And if you can, you know, obviously, you know, try to measure the maximal dimension of the pocket and then go from there, right? So usually 97% procedural success rate and a 4% procedural complication rate sometimes. All right, so let's move on to some questions. How about this, guys? This hallmark triad for cardiac tamponade is called? Yes. Perfect, guys. I think all of you have to go to Jeopardy, right? All right, but what does it include? OK. OK. So hypotension with narrow pulse pressure, distant heart sounds, and jugular venous distension. Again, I, I put this one to remember the pathophysiology of tamponade, right, guys? It's the increased you know, intrapericardial pressure, which is not transmitting and causing interventricular dependence. And that's why you see this, right? All right, if someone guesses this right, then, oh, I think I gave out the answer. Let me go back. <laughs> What is the structure marked by the red arrow? <laughs> Maybe make it bigger. So it's in between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. I think I gave out the answer, right? All right, so pericardial sinuses. You know, I really wanted to talk about this because I want you to know what's normal, right? And also, remember, you know, when you're talking about pericardium, you also want to think about the, what is normal. What is normal fluid in pericardial sinuses, right? So in this case, obviously, we are talking about the transfer sinus. And again, stay tuned to the pericardial lecture and anatomical variance lecture, which, you know, will go into the details. But the pericardial, uh, you know, transfer sinus is the reflection between the iota and the pulmonary artery. And the the oblique sinus is the one which is right behind the left atrial appendage, right? And it's more obvious in patients who have pericardial effusions. And also, you can sometimes actually see fat in the pericardial sinuses when it's more obvious with the fluid around. So important. What, what was the question we were asking? That's actually the superior aortic recess. It's the component of the transfer sinus which is in between those two structures. And if you actually look, look at ASC guidelines, this is the picture from there. You know, which actually suggests the importance of knowing that sinus in relation to assessing pericardial effusion. All right, what is this one, guys? Exaggerated inspiratory decrease in SBP of more than 10. Perfect, okay, and what about this one? Kuh small sign. Right, again, remember the pathophysiology. And every first year fellow, please do so. If you did not do, please you know, know how to check Pelsus paradoxes, right? So one time, do it bedside to know how to do that. Let's talk about this case here. And let's see if you can guess what's happening here. It's actually a low pressure tamponade, right? So what is different in this? It's a shock-like state with hypovolemia and elevated pericardial pressures. But what you don't see here is the RV, right? It's actually pretty small and underfilled, suggesting hypovolemia. And in this case, as opposed to those dilated and you know dilated IVCs, you're going to have a smaller IVC with inspirational collapse. In these cases, what you do basically is volume, you know, uh, you know, resuscitate them and reassess for pericardial effusion. Right, so that's the low pressure tamponade. How about here, guys? What happened before and after? Okay, 
Well, let me show you the chest x-ray. Maybe you can tell me what happened. Right, right. So it's almost a whiteout of the left chest wall. So it's a large left pleural effusion. And can pleural effusions cause tamponade, guys? Very much so, right? So that, that's the importance of this one. So I, not just the pericardial fluid, right? Sometimes anything which increases intrathoracic pressure can cause tamponade-like physiology. That's why I put it in, you know, in, in this case to show that their pleural effusions can cause tamponade as well. All right, what happened to our cardiology fellow, remember guys? He's now running to the CICU, right? So let's move on to case two. Is that Ryan? Yeah, probably. 67-year-old <laughs> male with prior history of hypertension and hyperlipidemia who was admitted for COVID, who was then evaluated by cardiology for chest pain and shortness of breath. And this EKG there. Just the most obvious ones. So ST depressions you see, right? V3 to V6. So the patient appropriately ended up getting a cath, had a high grade ulcerative mid RCA lesion. Shortly right after, patient got intubated for respiratory distress in the cath lab, becomes hypotensive, now on pressors, in the CCU, high CVP, urinary output is poor, and lactate is now going up. So post MI, what do you think happened, guys? Acute worsening post MI, I'm sure all of you are guessing it, right? OK, what else? I mean, I think we are in the right track by guessing it's some sort of mechanical complication going on. Right, so LV failure, RV failure. Pap muzzle rupture, I think I heard that, right? VSD, I heard that, and a free wall rupture, right? So those are the things you really want to think about, guys, right? So I know we get a lot of stats in the echo lab, but these are something we are actually looking for because these are real emergencies, right? So you really want to react pretty fast. What's the next step of choice? And stat. <laughs> no guesses, right? All right, let's see if you can guess what's happening. What kind of MR? Okay. <laughs> Something is happening, sorry. Sorry, apologize, guys. Keep guessing in the meantime. <laughs> Something happened. Why? Seriously? Sorry, guys, wrong time for a Microsoft update to the Methodist laptop, I guess. Just two more minutes. Yeah, see that? Can you believe that? It's like installing updates. Yeah. So before we move on, I think it's just going to take us a couple of minutes. I do want to talk to you about, so maybe one of you can guess, you know, one echo emergencies. We can talk about one emergency you had to deal with. Right, Gina, should we start with you? Any emergency you've encountered? Uh, OK. Yeah. That's good. So it was a pretty classic tamponade. OK. How about you, Smita? Flail, okay. Okay. Severe AI, okay. How about you, Ryan? I'm, I'm sure you've already encountered at least one so far. Any any emergencies you've encountered? It's just going to restart. It's charging though, right? I plugged it in there. Right? It's not charging though. Sorry about that, just two more minutes.
I think I've seen that joke with, uh, you know, with uh, astronauts like in, you know, in NASA, where right before the takeoff, like, you know, the computer starts updating. <laughs> Yes, dissections. What else, guys? Okay. Interesting. Okay. How about you, Timmy? Severe TR. Severe TR. After right at cat. <laughs> Which you did, Timmy? You did the right at cat? Sorry guys, I don't know why this is taking a longer. All right, I hope you didn't forget the case. Let's take a look here. All right. So what's the next step in the management of this patient, guys? Surgical, right? So definitely, I think you all guessed it right. So that's acute MR from a papillary muscle rupture and emergent surgery. So what are the clues to identify acute MR in this case? I'm sure some of you were saying, hey, why is the color Doppler signal like that, right? So very eccentric MR jet direction. And short duration of MR with the V-wave cutoff sign, very important, right, guys? So you're not going to see that frank holosystolic murmur in this case. What else? Tachycardia, low MR velocity. Very, very important clue is that hyperdynamic left ventricle with minimal cardiac output, right? You see a stroke volume of like, you know, 20, but you see that the LV is fine with hyperdynamic ventricle. Obviously, the flow is going somewhere, and you should think about acute MR. And it's very poor, clin poorly tolerated clinically, and that's why it's an emergency, and you have to fix it surgically. All right, what about this one? Our famous apical aneurysm, right? I'm sure you're all going to at least get this one time in your life. And this, in this case, you're definitely sure where I know I should say one of the exceptions where you know echo is not bad when compared to CMR. Although I should say CMR has much higher, you know, sensitivity in that. So thanks to Dr. Pasha for this image, you can clearly see that there's a large apical thrombus, right? And in you know. I should say echo was pretty diagnostic in this case, especially the dark blood sequences on the CMR are pretty classic for this. What about this one? What about the wide neck, right? Pseudoaneurysm, right? So it's an inferior or inflow lateral wall usually involved. What about this one? Yeah, very interesting, right? So the unique feature in this case, if you pay attention, it's a pretty fenestrated appearing BSD, right? It has a bimodal you know, uh, you know, distribution usually with happening because it can happen very early post-MI and it can sometimes can happen a couple of days after as well. So very important to know what are the differences between aneurysm versus pseudoaneurysm versus a diverticulum, you know. And, and in this case, you saw that we, the first case we saw was a typical apical aneurysm with a wide neck. And if you see, it's in continuity with the rest of the left ventricular contour. Versus pseudoaneurysm usually happens in the inferior or infralateral walls, and it's mainly a contained rupture. Diverticulum, on the other hand, is basically a normal, you know, it's a normal anatomical variant where you actually have outpouching of the left ventricle. But what's different is that it doesn't have the enhancement in the wall of the sac because it's a normal entity, right? So you don't see that uh, abnormal scarring. All right, what happened to our fellow now? He went to the floor, I guess, right? So let's go to our case three, 54-year-old male with no prior medical history, comes in for TIA-like episode and is now complaining of 10 out of 10 chest pain radiating to his back, I'm sure. Why was an echo ordered? 
the CT was broke. <laughs> Don't ask us, right? So, but if you see clearly, what do you see here, guys? Yeah, and you see that weird looking AR, right? So very important to recognize, right? Type A aortic dissection, you clearly see the individual mobile dissecting flap. And again, you know, it can sometimes prolapse through the root, like in our case, interfering with the mechanical function of the aortic leaflets, causing aortic regurgitation. Definitive test of choice is definitely, you know, a, a TE or a CT. And MRA is also pretty diagnostic, as you see these beautiful images down there. But one thing I think we frequently encounter, myself, I've encountered more than once, is this question about reverberation artifact we sometimes see, right? How do you do this? Especially our sonographer friends in the room, you guys give us the best images, and especially, and you know, you guys give us the information when you see something like this, we are always thankful to you for doing those additional images, right? So whenever you see something, immediately think about reverberation versus artifact, or, you know, and then you obviously want to give us more views to show if it's consistently seen in all views. And obviously, a real one will have distinct edges, and, you know, if it's a shadow, it doesn't usually carry that. Independent motion, usually seen in the dissection flaps, but not in these reverberation artifacts because they move with the structure which is causing that. And also associated abnormalities, very important, right? So if you see any associated valvular abnormalities or anything else, obviously you want to think more in the dissection. But remember, in real life, like I just said, you know, the sonographers are the ones helping us add biplane imaging, color M mode, color Doppler, all those additional images to help us with the right identification. All right, some cool but unfortunate cases within our lab. This is an amazing eight centimeter aortic aneurysm, guys. See that? With severe AR. This one again is a 9.4 centimeter aortic aneurysm. I hope you can see that, right? Pretty, pretty big. And this one here is a saccular localized dissecting aneurysm on a CT. So very important to recognize. I think the biggest I've seen is that 9.4 so far. I'm sure Dr. Q has seen bigger than that. All right. Our friend is still running, right? So case four, 63-year-old female with hypertension, DVT, and cervical cancer who was admitted for femoral fracture after a fall, now had a repair and had sudden onset of shortness of breath and chest pain. Let's take a look at this EKG. S1, Q3, I think all of you guessed it right, right? So what else do you see? The right bundle, right axis deviation, right, and T-wave inversions in V1 through V3, all suggesting RV ischemia. Again, remember the CT is still broken, so what's the next test of choice? <laughs> of course, an echo, right? So let's see what, if you can guess this one. Right, so what is McConnell sign? I know I heard you guys say that. Okay, so I want you to remember the mechanism so it's easier, right? So definitely CT is the test of choice, but what you're seeing here is echinases of the RV mid free wall. So if you see the basal and the mid RV are not really functioning, but the apex is still moving. You know, and one, one quick point is actually, uh, you know, Dr. McConnell was a cardiology fellow when he had discovered the sign. So I'm sure all of you guys are gonna work on one sign for you each, right? So, and the mechanism here is tethering of the apex from hyperdynamic LV versus localized ischemia on the RV free wall from the increased wall stress is another reason, right? What about, you know, are we, we are still talking about this from 1996 to 2023. Is it still holding relevant? Very much so, right? So there's a lot of newer data talking about similar features even now. And there's also an entity called reverse McConnell. Sometimes, you know, you don't really see that classic McConnells too. And what other entity can you think of when you talk about reverse McConnell, guys? Anything else which strikes the mind where? Takasubo, exactly, guys, right? So that's another, you know, a feature you want to keep in mind. And again, not always a pulmonary embolism, any case of RV ischemia can also cause something similar. And again, you know, it's definitely, you know, still evident, right? If you think, if you look at this, you really want to, you know, think about PE for sure. All right, what happened to our cardiology fellow? I think he went home, right? Actually, no. <laughs> All right, let's see if you can guess what's happening here. I'm sure these are not the classic emergencies, but I'm sure you guys are gonna encounter it's actually an abdominal aortic image, and if you see what is happening with the contrast, you can see it better, right? There's a huge area of large intramural hematoma. 
So that's an abdominal iota intramural hematoma. Again, echo contrast is super helpful. If you're not sure, always remember, guys, don't hesitate to send the person back and get some more images, right? So get some contrast images. And of course, CT is definitely diagnostic. What about this one? It's a tough one, right? You know, in this case, it was the distribution was like that, but uh, you know, we should we call it hematoma versus thrombus when we do call it, because it's hard to say on an echo. Yeah, some I heard the word thrombus in transit, right? So how could you say that? You can clearly see I know technically difficult images, but definitely that's the real life, right? So you don't get crystal clear images all the time. But what's more important than this is to see that you see that in the right atrium and the left atrium, right? And you see it's, it's kind of almost in the interatrial septum and as you are actually, in, and remember echo is a dynamic thing, right? So you can actually see events happening in real time too. So you can clearly see that it's a PFO, it's going through the PFO, which is that thrombus in transit, definitely deserves a call from the echo lab, right? What about this one? Severe biventricular dysfunction, right? Very important to call in case of any interval change. You know, if this is something new, you know that the cardiac output is minimal. You see that interventricular dependence to just from the extremely low cardiac output, right? What do you see on the right side of the image? L severe low flow, what, what can happen in the aortic root is it's an itis for a thrombus, right? So you want to alert them about this as well. So this is also considered an echo emergency as well. And any time you see any interval changes, guys, that's still, you know, it's not an emergency, but I still feel like, you know, the primary team needs to know about that because if it is a major interval change happening between two echocardiograms, you know, we definitely want to correlate it clinically. What about this? This is not a fetal ultrasound, guys. <laughs> yeah, so you're doing a TEE, right? This is an iota view of the TEE. It's pretty projectile, right? Like it's more than 5 mm for sure. So grade 5 atheroma, right, in the aortic arch, right, definitely deserves a call too, especially when we're doing, you know, stroke assessment. This is something you don't want to miss when you're assessing, you know, when you're doing TEE. Well, how can we not talk about cardiac masses? I'm sure every one of us, especially all the faculties, can vouch to you about how many times we've had to call about different types of cardiac masses. I don't want to go into the details because I know we are going to have an MMI lecture soon about cardiac masses. But again, you know, if you look at this one, this is a complex mediastinal mass. You see on the, you know, in the pericardial, it's almost above the pericardial space, and that's why I'm calling it mediastinal. And in this case, you see that, you know, large mobile mass in the right atrium. In this one, you know, it's actually a multiple, you know, the, the echo recognized only one of them, but cardiac MRI nailed it with, you know, saying it's multiple cardiac mets of met metastatic melanoma. Right, guys? All right. So I think it's a lot of information, especially for our first year fellows, but I think we've covered most of the cardiac emergencies. But do you think we've covered all the cardiac emergencies, guys? What happened to our fellow? <laughs> all right. Well, we're going to give an, uh, Gina an applause. So you think we covered all the cardiac emergencies? Probably not, right? So Gina is going to show us some more. Always look. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Actually, do you want to just mm -hmm. leave this up here and I can put sure. it? Sure. I'm not sure because it's turning off. I was worried. Okay. I'll leave it here, I, I think. I'm just going to leave this one up here in my notes. And then I can pull her. Just use her. You just want me to use mine? Sure. I'm just worried because it was. The fellow is still running, sorry. <laughs> this 
is not the one, right? I think I pulled it out. This is the one, final one. No. Maybe just go to your email. Downloads. Let me just go to the email. See? It's like we're doing weird stuff. So Dr. Shervalu and I just wanted to um, quickly go over a couple interesting cases and some clinical pearls that go along with those cases um, related to today's topic. in one slide, go over a couple echo images, and then discuss some clinical pearls, okay? Um, so first, we'll start with our first case. Um, it is a 57-year-old female. Uh, she's got a past medical history of interstitial lung disease due to scleroderma, um, and subsequently has group three pulmonary hypertension. She recently had a right heart cath. Her mean pH is in the 40s. Um, so she's coming in feeling short of breath, uh, worsening lower extremity edema and orthopnea. Home medications, she takes medicines for her scleroderma, um, hypertension, and also Lasix. Her blood pressure on arrival, 106 over 73. Heart rate is 103. She's saturating 97% on five liters. Typically, she uses three at home. Her basic labs, CBC, CMP, mostly unremarkable. Um, she does have an elevated BNP, 1200. The ER got a CTA to rule out a PE, which showed a right-sided pleural effusion and moderate pericardial effusion. Um, so of course, we're gonna go ahead and check our echo out. Um, is it gonna be this one? Perfect. Um, so let's see if we can, so um, if anyone wants to take a, a quick stab at this first picture here that we're seeing on the left. Massive, yeah. Uh, posterior, I see a posterior pericardial effusion as well. Uh, the LV is contracted okay. Mm -hmm. I think it's okay, and, but the RV is not. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So RV is huge, which. Um, <coughs> is somewhat to be expected in a patient with pulmonary hypertension or long-standing right-sided filling pressures, um, maybe not quite this large. Um, but yeah, we are seeing that LV, it, significant diastolic collapse, um, indicating very, very high uh, pericardial pressures. So what is different about this, guys, right? That, that's 
the component we want to focus on, right? So it's an LV diastolic collapse, right? In patients with severe pulmonary hypertension, you're not going to see those classic signs because the RAP and RV, you know, and diastolic pressures are super high, so you're obviously not going to have the typical RAV collapse. In these patients, you want to look out for LA and LV tamponade, right? So in this case, you clearly see that there is LV and diastolic collapse. Okay, go next. And important unit of peril is that these patients Pulses paradoxes, right. So you may die. Mm -hmm. So at the bedside, you may be looking bad, you mm -hmm. may be looking 90 to 100, but you won't hear any pulses paradoxes, you may be on the side of the bed. And that's because the eye is so big. Yeah. And, and, and also, you know, uh, you know, one important point again in this one is, so I think you heard Dr. Q, right? So you're not going to have those typical bedside features as well. And that's why having focus skills is very important, right? So grab your echo probe and just put the probe in it when you're in doubt. And obviously, you know, phone a friend, call the attending if you're still not sure if there is LV that, you know, it, it's something which is, you've not seen this before, so don't hesitate to call us. So um, other things that we just wanted to talk about in regards to the uh, infusion with pulmonary hypertension. So in most cases, and this is a debated data as of right now, um, in severe pulmonary hypertension, it's contraindicated on a case-by-case -case basis um, to drain the pericardial fluid. Um, and the theory behind this is actually the pressure from the effusion is actually kind of keeping the RV in shape um, and, and uh, preventing it from further expanding, causing torrential TR. Um, and also prevents bowing of the intraventricular septum into the LV, um, which would cause decreased filling pressures on the left side and decreased cardiac output. Um, but again, case by case basis. In the patient that we just saw, she was actually medically managed and diuresed. Um, I think they got about five liters off of her in the CCU. Um, they got a follow up echo two days later, and there was still a very large effusion, but there was no longer any chamber collapse. Okay, which other effusion should not be drained, guys? Which other situation, I would say pericardial effusion should never be drained. Dissection. Dissection, right? So very important too, because that's also like almost like a compression, you know what I mean? Like it, it's holding up, like whatever is happening. So if you put a needle in there, you're almost going to like start bleeding out, right? Dr. Pasha was about to say. Yeah, so important points, right? All right, let's move on to case two. All right, so we have a, 70, a 78-year-old male who had a cabbage, um, also medical history of CKD. His postoperative course was complicated by oligarch renal failure, uh, requiring CRRT, AFib, he was started on anticoagulation, okayed by the surgeons, and postoperative anemia. On post-op day number 12, he started having worsening shortness of breath, requiring up to 10 liters, and then BiPAP. Blood pressure, 131 over 78, heart rate in the 70s, saturating 93% on 10 liters. And so here we're seeing a very, very large posterior fusion. I think we measured it at about three centimeters. Um, and then if we can play this picture here on the other side. So we're able to see not only is it posterior, but also lateral effusion. And then we're seeing some um, extra echoes within the pericardial space, suggesting some type of fibroadhesive material. Um, we're also seeing that the, the lateral aspect of the effusion is really compressing the LA. 
So what's different about this case, guys? What do you think about this one, right? So post-operative, very, very common scenario. I think every cardiology fellow is going to encounter this at least once, is post-operative, you know, pericardial effusions, especially post-cab, post, in any, any post-sternotomy we are talking about. So important to analyze that these patients don't have, typically have that classic distribution. They don't have that classic circumferential distribution. They can be localized, right? So that's important to recognize. And in this case, again, if you see, if you pay attention, there is that LV and the LA collapse here, right? So that's again another regional kind of tamponade situation, uh, you know, which you should be alerted about. Again, you're going to see those classic signs again. So you see that, and again, might not be exactly, you know, because patient can be diuretist and patient, you know, is probably, you know, on BiPAP. In this case, patient is having some respiratory distress. So remember those features too, right? Clinical diagnosis is what, what is important. And so this patient was taken back to the OR um, and for mediastinal exploration, and they evacuated a large amount of clots within the pericardium. So uh, as Dr. Shepard was saying, for these pericardial hematomas, um, they often cause regional or localized cardiac tamponades, not, and you're not always gonna have the classic signs or symptoms that you would typically think of with a circumferential pericardial effusion. Um, and treatment is different. They have to go back to the OR for some type of surgical intervention. Next we have All right, we have this a- This is our last case? Yeah, last case. A 52-year-old female with severe MR also has antiphospholipid syndrome. So she initially uh, presented for a planned mitroclip procedure, but the procedure unfortunately was aborted as during the procedure she was found to have um, an elevated mitral valve gradient due to her worsening stenosis. So she ended up undergoing a mitral valve replacement with mechanical valve several days later. Her post output, of course, was of course complicated by AFib and A-flutter. She was very, very symptomatic, short of breath, chest pain, very anxious when she was in AFib. Uh, they ended up calling a CERT on her due to the worsening shortness of breath and chest pain. Blood pressure was 115, uh, over 75, heart rate 137, um, and they had placed her on a little bit of oxygen. So right off the bat, we're seeing very large effusion once again. And if we take a, a closer look, we're actually seeing that it's loculated um, with more fibrinous material inside. So if you, if you pay attention to the previous echo versus this one, this one you see obvious hemorrhagic echo dense material in the pericardial space, right? So this is a more you know, focal pericardial hematoma in this case, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so you can see that. Um, you see the interventricular dependence again here. So again, post-surgical, localized, you know, eccentric effusions, usually, you know, don't underestimate these, right? Especially if you think it's a pericardial hematoma, it can progress pretty fast. And like Gina just mentioned, these are the patients who need surgical re-exploration. So very important to know these different variant tamponades so that, you know, you can be alerted clinically too. I think we have just in that one minute. last slide, basically um, just discussing that tamponade in general is a constellation of symptoms. Just because they have one uh, sign or symptom and are missing others doesn't mean that they can't have tamponade. And especially in these last couple of cases that we discussed, um, there can be localized um, tamponade, which was kind of a, a new thought to me within this past year um, and not something that we're always on the lookout for. So and again, important to look at the patient as a whole, their underlying past medical history and um, their hospitalization course as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah. We'll take any questions and thank you, Gina, for volunteering. So any questions, guys? CT.
Yeah, especially okay. post transplant, like you know, those you know different locations you need to look out. All right, guys, any other questions? Thanks for coming, guys. <laughs>